There are many ancient areas which we often cover, which you, the viewer, will clearly realize is of a controversial nature, especially regarding dates in which we claim are actively being denied and concealed by powerful and wealthy academic institutions. Many ancient relics within, and the fact that these, what we claim are lost antiquities, are often dated by us merely through logical processes of deduction, are therein dated far before the officially guarded modern development of man, or the path thereof. My work is actively denied, and regardless of the mountain, and still mounting volumes of evidence we present, still denied as having ever existed. Funding refused en masse in regards to any consideration whatsoever possible officially. Thus any claim in any form of a highly advanced civilization except our own ever occurring here on Earth before will always be denied. Civilization so old, their ruins now easily dismissed by geologists the world over as natural formations. However, thanks to the fact that nature rarely builds walls and courses, or create enormous megalithic walls of equal sizes built in techniques akin to the modern house brick, yet with bricks often many hundreds, sometimes thousands of tons in weight, and all once seemingly effortlessly placed atop one another. And thanks to these clear factual elements, which can allow us to identify the artificial nature of many formations claimed as geological. This evidence thankfully still being visible upon these so-called geological formations. Features which enable all with critical capacities to distinguish that of a ruin academically suppressed by being systematically dismissed as geological. Kaimanawa Wall, near Lake Taupo, New Zealand, is but one example of this massive dismissal of ancient antiquity, reluctantly explored by mainstream academia in the late 90s. However, an individual by the name of Barry Brailsfords also published an article in the New Zealand Listener, which stated, as we do, that the wall is not geological, and for a brief moment created a public exposure of mainstream archaeology and historical institutions' active refusal of the obvious in favor of the already concluded. Barry Brailsford's valiant journalism considers the possibility of a lost civilization, like one mentioned earlier and although, in his opinion, is located within permitted history, and our claim is of one far older, pre-Ice Age in fact, he still, regardless, pinned its creation on the correct parties. Titled Megalith Mystery, are giant stones in the Kaimanawa Forest Park evidence of an ancient New Zealand culture? According to Brailsford's article, the stone wall is at least 2,000 years old and was created by the first settlers of New Zealand, the Waitaha. Furthermore, Brailsford also pertained to the wall being a link between New Zealand, Egypt, and South America. We feel his article is a very well-presented investigation into what is clearly an ancient ruin of artificial origin. However, we attest to the wall being a relic of a once far more advanced and much older, now lost civilization. Brailsford listed 12 pieces of evidence for its construction. For example, the fact that the visible stones in the front are a uniform 1.9 meters wide by 1.6 meters tall and 1 meter wide deep. However, politically, the view that civilizations existed in New Zealand before the Maori culture, the currently protected paradigm, is never going to be accepted. The conclusion made by the commission funded geologists, it that the formation is merely an outcrop of a large ignimbrite, a natural formation created about 330,000 years ago. They claim the uniform shapes were produced by conveniently identical fractures in the rock. The official line is that the Kaimanawa wall has been proclaimed a natural rock formation. And we know better than many that this tale of events is very unlikely to change in the future. Yet, regardless of this, we find the Kaimanawa wall highly compelling. We often find that many of the most intriguing, enigmatic, and as yet unexplained ancient ruins found all over our world are regularly claimed as the legacy of more recent, well-studied, permitted ancestors. However, 
This constant attribution to lesser developed ancestors, studied and understood intimately through funded investigation, is self contradictory in nature. For the parallel study of said ages, and in turn early man's development, disproves their own claim of said individual's culpability or indeed capabilities. It seems that, although only a specific tale of events is publicly permitted for grants, offering financial security to so-called professors and historians, all willing to toe the proverbial line, inadvertently expose themselves without any outside intervention. Due to the detailed, well-established understandings possessed by modern archaeological study, we are, by default, also made intimately aware of the tools available to each of the claimed culprits, the knowledge levels in which they possessed, and the fact that many other factors regarding our not-so-distant ancestors disproves academia's own testimony when it comes to them as claimed builders. However, although, in our opinion, there is overwhelming evidence to suggest that many ancient ruins were instead re-inhabited by these claimed constructors, utilizing these ancient sites, often fortresses, beneficial, often ingenious, and baffling constructions safely, virtually impenetrable designs, and thus solid foundations for the development of their own civilizations, not only allowed them to flourish, but also leaving behind a detailed array of archaeological finds, used as the basis of academia's claim of these groups having built these sites, but also claiming such sites as their work in historical records, records which are always absent any explanation as to how this was achieved. There also exist sites on Earth that, instead of allowing funded individuals to use additional re-inhabitations as a basis for an argument for their origins, can instead, due to the sheer mass of these historical footprints, each stacked atop one another, can instead actually indicate the site's enormous age. A land feature generated as a result of this incredibly long-lived accommodation that we call tells. Tells are artificial mounds formed from the accumulated refuse from generations of people. Tells are most commonly associated with the archaeology of the ancient Near East, but they are also found elsewhere, such as Central Asia, Eastern Europe, West Africa, and Greece. Within the Near East, they are concentrated in less arid regions, including Upper Mesopotamia, the Southern Levant, Anatolia and Iran which had more continuous settlement. What can only be explained as man-made, artificially generated sedimentary layers, one has to ask themselves how long would a particular site have to have been inhabited for to create such enormous, incredibly deep layers of earthwork, merely generated by its inhabitants living in said area, clearly for an unimaginably long period of time. The herbal citadel, for example, locally called Kalat, is a tell located within the historical city center of Erbil in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. The citadel appeared for the first time in historical sources in the Ibla tablets around 2300 BC, and although it has been confirmed as having been inhabited as far back as the Neolithic period, we have long argued due to their activities and capabilities that the Neolithics were a surviving remnant of the most recent lost civilization. If this is so, then it is highly likely that the citadel of Erbil is in fact far older than that of even the Neoliths, its incredible height also indicative of an inconceivably long history of virtually continuous inhabitation. How old is the Erbil citadel, or indeed the world's tells in general? Is it an earthwork merely started by our Neolithic ancestors? Or is it possibly a relic spanning far before currently understood or indeed accepted timelines for man? They are, undoubtedly, highly compelling. The Dighton Rock A 40-ton boulder in Massachusetts, USA is a mysterious relic indeed. Not only does it not fit in with the surrounding environment, but the incredibly ancient inscriptions found upon it could unlock highly controversial truths regarding the reach of ancient civilization 
that would fly in the face of current academic theory. What is interesting regarding this enormous rock is that it was not only placed where it now lay by natural geologic activities many millennia ago, dropped where it lay on the shores of the Taunton River by the melting of an ancient glacier during the end of the last ice age, measuring 5 feet high, 9.5 feet wide, and 11 feet long, made of gray-brown crystalline sandstone. But no one has been able to say with certainty who first wrote upon the rock, what they wanted to communicate, or why they created these mysterious markings, with it now known to have been the inspiration for over 1,000 books and articles and the basis for over 35 hypotheses. The mystery, and indeed debate, regarding the writings on the Dighton Rock continue to this day. And a possible motivation for the mystery to remain unsolved is to protect the currently attested academic theories regarding the past of man. Thus, they could quite possibly be markings left by a past, now lost civilization, or one that has long been claimed to have been unable to have had such far-reaching settlements. The antiquity of the writings is undoubtable, as many scientific investigations have proved that they are indeed very old. Yet what is hotly debated is the origins, and indeed the civilization responsible for creating them. Although, predictably, since 1680, when Reverend John Danforth visited the rock, a mainstream academically approved theory regarding the stone has been put forward and popularized by said institutions. However, the fact that the glyphs, or possible language etched upon the rock, has never been deciphered remains. After seeing it, he decided that the carvings on it were made by Native Americans specifically the Wampanoag Indians, after being told the tale of a ship arriving, and a battle between the locals and mysterious newcomers were told to him from long ago in the distant past. Danforth drew the symbols visible on the top half of the petroglyph, and then wrote, quote, It is reported from the tradition of the old Indians that there came a wooden house with men of another country in it, swimming up the river Asinet, that fought the Indians and slew their sachem. Such interpret the figures to be hieroglyphical, the first figure representing a ship without mast and mere rack cast upon the shoals, the second representing a head of land, possibly a cape with a peninsula." End quote. Danforth's drawings were requested by the Royal Society of London in 1732 and are now preserved in the British Museum. This not only proof of their acceptance by mainstream academia, possibly due to its lack of any controversial claims, just a simple mention of newcomers, and no further mention of their possible identity. Yet the fact that these inscriptions remain undecipherable makes the possibility of the newcomers being from a locality nearby illogical, and suggests that they were, instead, created by a group who came from a now lost or possibly concealed advanced civilization. Another hypothesis put forward by Isra Stiles in 1767, while he was the president of Yale College, claimed that the famous seafarers, the Phoenicians, had made their way all the way to North America on at least one voyage. Stiles believed that the writings were left by them to simply show that they were once there. Stiles' idea was a popular one in Europe for some time, and were embraced by Antoine Corte Gebelin, a French scholar, as a possible answer to the identity of their creators. He said that the carvings on the rock should be split into three sections, the past, present, and future. Some of the images he identified were an oracle and butterfly, representing the future, a horse and a beaver meeting, symbolical representations of the two contents interacting in the present, and the divine figures or symbols of Minerva, Telesphore, and Priapus, representative of the past. Yet the mystery of who created the carvings remains to this day. Additionally, the original location of the carvings also remains a mystery. The fact that the boulder has landed where it now lay, due to geological activities, means it could have originated in a location far away from where it now lay. Was it made by a now lost civilization? Or possibly one that academia continues to claim was not able to travel such vast distances? 
The mystery surrounding the Dighton Rock continues, and it is undoubtedly one that is highly compelling.